Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons, the Forward Corporation, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Well, thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction, and welcome to another edition of the Outdoor Magazine Radio Show, right here on the Outdoor Magazine Radio Network, on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan, and so glad to have you along with us. How are you? Did you enjoy that nice weather when it was here? Boy, it was nice there for a while, wasn't it? Mother Nature just doesn't know what she wants to do this year. She's been all over the place. As you are hearing this show, now it is the month of March. Does March come in like a lion or like a lamb this year? And what does that mean for the rest of the late winter, early spring? It just hasn't felt much like winter. It's felt more like spring, hasn't it? The red-winged blackbirds are back at the Avery house on the pond behind the house. I've been waiting to hear him, waiting to hear him, didn't hear him, didn't hear him, looked out the back window the other day, and there's a red-winged blackbird singing, sitting in the tree in the backyard next to the pond. Couldn't get a picture of it, but I did. Next time I walked outside, I heard him back there, and I thought, ah, oh, here we go. Skunks have been active. Red-winged blackbirds are back. Oh, it's March, but in those last few days of February, I was able to get out on the open water of Saginaw Bay and the Saginaw River. I told you I was jonesing. I said, I got to get out there and go fishing. My angler quest is shrink wrapped at Linwood Beach Marina. What am I going to do? I don't have a river boat. I don't have a smaller boat. But I got friends, and I know people. So I called Captain Mark Pananzak of Real Fishing. I said, Mark, can I book you for a half-day charter? Can we do a combo trip? Can we do a, a skinny water trip trolling and a jigging the Saginaw River trip? Can we do that? Are you available that day? He says, yeah, 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 I'm available. Let's go fishing. And then I say booked him, but later on I tried to pay him, and he didn't want to let me pay him. But I did anyway. I, I think, you know, when, when these captains, like, like for, like for uh, charity auctions too, like for our Trinity event, keep in mind that even if you are getting a donated trip, there's still time involved in this. There's fuel, there's wear and tear on the boat and equipment, and there's the captain's time. So make sure you take care of these people. I mean, they love to fish, but it's also their job, right? So take care of them. Anyway, we went out of the launch at the mouth of the Saginaw River and turned left out into the bay and didn't go far. And we fished the same skinny water that I fished in the summertime. But it was February. And it wasn't that bad. It was chilly, but it wasn't bitter. And we hit a window of opportunity where the wind wasn't bad. The conditions were beautiful. So we put out bandits behind offshore boards, 10 feet behind the boards. This is the style of fishing that I love. But I usually don't get to do it until the summertime. Why do I love this type of fishing? Because number one, I like trolling. I like trolling skinny water. I like running baits close to the boards. And I found out I like trolling this time of year because there are no weeds out there. There's no junk. There's no anything else. It's just clean water and fish. And we had a great time. Now, we did only get one nice fish in that skinny water. We got one other bite, didn't hook up. But this was about a, well, Mark says it's a four-pound fish. Great big belly on it, big pre-spawn fish. Uh, Captain Mark says it's a four-pound fish. I said, you know, by the time I tell this story on the air, it's probably going to be an eight-pound fish. 
Well, there's a picture of it online, so I can't call it an eight pound fish, but it was a good solid fish. So we trolled out there for a while and said, you know, I said, Mark, I really want to get up the river and do some jigging. He said, let's go. So we go up the river along with a couple of hundred other boats because, again, it was a beautiful day. It was warm. There was a little bit of wind. The wind started to pick up, and that was fighting our drift, but still, it was great. Um, I love to jig. I love my trolling, but I like jigging. There's something about having that rod in your hand when a fish hits. But what I was reminded while fishing that day with Mark is that I don't jig fish enough anymore to be really any good at it. I used to have a pretty good, pretty good feel. You know, I, I really had it down. I felt like I had pretty, pretty good technique. I could feel every bite. I didn't miss many fish. But I just don't do it enough anymore these days to be really very good at it. So Mark's up in the front of the boat catching fish left and right, and I'm in the back of the boat catching a few fish. Got a lot of small fish, uh, a couple more keepers in the river, and Mark uh, took a, a jumbo perch up in there as well. But it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience to be out there on the water, trolling, fishing the river, open water in February. Man. So thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Also, thank you, Mark, for uh, Captain Mark Pananzac for uh, donating a trip for our Trinity Monitor Wild Game Dinner and Auction, a fundraiser for our uh, church and school. Now, depending on when you hear this radio show, the event may be getting ready to kick off or it may have already happened. So I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage there, but I just I feel that it's going to be that it was another successful event. I think God has blessed this event since the beginning, we've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of good people involved. We've had a lot of people who have helped donate to the cause to make this happen. And I, I want to mention just, just a few of them here. And if I miss somebody, I'm so sorry because I can't, I can't thank everybody. But just people that I directly deal with and people that I directly reached out to. Linwood Beach Marina, thank you. Appreciate that. Linwood Taxidermy, Scott, thank you very much. Mike Hampton of Mike's Tire Sales in Cawcullen. I told you, I, Mike bought a trip with Captain Pananzac, and then he donated it to the Trinity event. And I had actually forgotten about this until Mark reminded me on the water. So Mike, Mark, Mike Hampton, thank you, Mike's Tire Sales. Michigan Brand Meats, Michigan Brand Products for a Year. How cool is that? Uh, Johnny Bowler, the Bear Whisperer, donated hunting and fishing trips. Matt Schock, a predator hunting trip. Thank you. Craig Plowman, Craig is all over this thing. He donated so much. We appreciate it. Craig Tapp, Captain Doug Ward, uh, a walleye fishing trip on Saginaw Bay, up by uh, Augre, up in that beautiful, deep, clear, crystal water. Uh, Mark Pananzac, I've mentioned. Paul Schlafly of Riverside Charters in Manistee. A salmon fishing trip. Gary Morgan of Wild Game Dynasty. A three-day guided Michigan turkey hunt. Schwab Farms. A, a youth hunt. Scott Hand. A youth hunt at his place. It, it's just been um, wonderful seeing how people have come together to work for a good cause, and I am, um, I am and was blessed to be a part of it. So thank you, everybody, who helped out on that. Now, we do have a couple of more events coming up. We're going to do another Wednesday Night Live at the Lumberjack Restaurant in West Branch. That is going to be Wednesday night, March 20th at the Lumberjack. I love the Lumberjack. It's a forward corporation Lumberjack restaurant, and it is the perfect venue well, especially now that Dixie Dave is retired and he's not in the old Dixie Inn restaurant or, or, or you know, his restaurant anymore. Oscar and Joey's, it was called. Uh, the Lumberjack is the perfect place to have such an event. Wednesday, March 20th. Call for reservations, 989-343-0892. 989-343-0892. Uh, oh, one more thing I want to talk about. March 5th. I think that's Tuesday. That is, would be, Fred Bear's birthday. Now, they're having a, a Fred Bear Day celebration uh, over the weekend in Grayling. But when I saw this, it reminded me that, you know, what, what, a, what an icon he was in Michigan and how fortunate I was to get a chance to meet the guy. So I was going through some old video the other day, and I came across, once again, the, I call it, it's on YouTube, the lost, quote, Fred Bear interview. Some people read that as the last interview, and they said, Avery, 
It wasn't the last interview we ever did. I said, I didn't say it was the last. I said it was the lost, the interview that I lost. So I actually found the raw video from that. And there, there is more B-roll, we call it. There is no more of the interview with Fred. That is all online. I posted every word he said online. But I found some more B-roll uh, that I had not posted online, including watching the guys from Bear Archery shoot a prototype crossbow at the range there at, Gr- at Grouse Haven. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's some way I can work that into uh, some kind of a video and post that online as well. So, uh, coming up on this week's Outdoor Mag. Okay, one thing I didn't mention about our fishing trip. As we were coming up to the ramp, I saw a boat doing something that caught my attention, catching fish that caught my attention. The captain on that boat is Captain Brandon Corthal. We're going to talk with him after the break about an interesting way to fish the Saginaw River for a species you might not think of. Then Bob Hines on burbot fishing in northern Lake Michigan, plus Ben Nielsen of Showspan talks about the Grand Rapids show coming up. In our second hour, Captain Pete Passalis on fishing the St. Clair River this time of year, plus the process of selling your old boat and buying a new one, then Rich Krizan of Killer Food Plots. And in our third hour, Jimmy Gretzinger, the host of Michigan Out of Doors TV, joins us, and of course, wild game chef extraordinaire, Dixie Dave Miner. That's coming up this week on Outdoor Magazine. My name is Mike Avery. The website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. The email address, Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. Don't hesitate to reach out. I'd love to hear from you. So glad you're along this week right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Alpena on WZTK 105.7. FM. You can hear us in St. Joe on WSJM 94.9 FM, and you can hear us north of the bridge in Iron Mountain, WMIQ 1450 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Premier Maritime Training. If you've ever wanted to get your captain's license, I think this is your best option. Uh, Captain John Littlefield taught my captain's class, and he can help you become a licensed charter captain as well. Check out the website pmtcaptains.com for more info. That's pmtcaptains.com. John has classes across the state, and I'm sure you can find one that'll fit your schedule. That's pmtcaptains.com. I was talking about a uh, a walleye fishing trip on the Saginaw, well, Saginaw Bay and Saginaw River uh, early last week during, when we had the real, real nice weather. And as we were coming upstream, actually it was downstream, uh, I saw this boat off to the side, a really cool looking boat. I mean, the, the boat got my attention because the, the graphics on it are very cool. And they were trolling. That also got my attention. Now, uh, early on in this resurgence of the Saginaw Bay walleye fishery, I used to troll that river a lot. And even these days in the summertime on a blow day, I will still troll the river. The boat I saw was trolling, and they were getting some fish, and it really, really got my attention. I found out one of the guys on that boat is Captain Brandon Corthall of Buckwild Charters. Now, I know Buckwild Charters because as I go in the channel to the marina where I keep my angler quest, he's right there. But he's in a big, I think it's a Grady White, so I didn't recognize it. Anyway, I, I reached out to Brandon after I got off the water and said, what were you guys doing? Can we talk about it on the radio show? And he said, sure. And here he is now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Brandon, welcome to the show. How are you? Good. How are you, Mike? Well, I- I'm doing good. As we are recording this today, I'm sitting in the studio, and I bet you're not on the water today, are you? Nope. It's a little brutal out there today. <laughs> so listen, tell me about your operation. I- I'm not used to seeing the boat that I saw you in yesterday at your slip. Yeah, I have the Grady White I run in the summertime. And then during the cold weather months, my dad has a nice use craft that we use on the Great Lakes. You know, we fish Lake Erie, Saginaw Bay. Um, we'll take it to Lake Michigan. It's a nice boat for what we do. Oh, those things are tanks, aren't they? Oh, yeah. So, listen, what what were you fishing for 
the other day when I saw you? I was fishing for walleye, but we ran into a school of pike, which typically you find quite a few of them laying up there as you're trying to catch the big pre-spawn walleyes coming up in the river. And we we landed probably 15 plus beautiful 35 to 40 inch pike up there trolling for walleyes. Well, you got my attention because, you know, as we're motoring by you to head to the launch, uh, I see one of your boards, one of your offshore boards goes zipping back and say, hey, they got a fish on. And then, boom, another one went zipping back. You go to the back of the boat. You got a fire drill going on there. And then I see, I see when you get the net out, and this is before I knew what you were fishing for, these monster fish, I'm thinking, I don't think that's a, a walleye. If it is, it's huge. I mean, it, it looked like so much fun. Oh, yeah. You know, we started the day we were going to head up jigging, but it was a little slow with the north wind slowed the current down. So I said, you know, we'll try the try the flats up on the edge of the river and see what we can do. I figured there'd be a few walleye in there, but we were surprised with a, a big school of northern pike sitting up in there, which, you know, typically I don't target them. But during that day, once I figured out that they were pike in there, you know, we just had some fun with them. You know, they're def- definitely a fun fish to fight. Yeah, once you discover fish like that, it'd be hard to uh, it'd be hard to go away from them, wouldn't it? Oh yeah. Do you routinely troll that river, Brandon? I do this time of year. You know, when you got your big pre-spawn walleyes coming in, and the Saginaw Bay starts to slow down a little bit in between schools coming in, I'll typically troll the edges. You know, not the channel. The channel seems to be a lot slower. There are guys that catch fish in the channel. I try to troll the edges five to ten foot of water up there and using your electronics is key you know all the new the new fancy lorances and hummingbirds got the side scan option and you can dial your side scan in so you can really see those schools of fish laying up there on the edge of that shallow river and uh you know anywhere from december to march i will look and scan in the sides of the river looking for schools of fish to catch up in there and this year, I haven't typically got into them as good as we did last year. One of my buddies last year, this was probably the first time I started trolling the river was last year. One of my buddies was doing really good, Captain Ethan Wright of Rightway Charters. He was the one who turned me on to it. He was doing really good trolling up that that same flat we were on the other day catching the pike. And, uh, you know, last year we were having some 15 to 20 fish days up there. Hmm. Does it matter if you troll upstream or down? I mean, if there's no current, no, it doesn't seem to matter. But if there is a little bit of a current, it seems going upstream is a little bit more productive. You can catch fish both going up and down, but I prefer to go upstream with the current real slow. What baits are you running, Brandon? You know... I try to run bandits and stuff up there with the big deep divers, and they, they're just too deep. They like to stick in the mud. I've been running P10s and hit sticks with the real shallow bill on them, so they're only diving down under the water two or three foot. Yeah, because you said you're up into, what, five, ten feet of water. Yep, so we're trying to keep the boat in anywhere from nine to ten foot of water. So your one side of your baits are up there in that probably almost a three to four foot of water you know, where them fish are. That actually, I mean, I was thinking while we were out there the other day, you know, fishing the the channel primarily, drifting and jigging. And I looked at all the other boats around there, and I'm thinking, these fish are getting pounded. They're getting bombarded. Even if they don't bite, they're still getting bothered by jigs bouncing all around them. It only makes sense that they would scoot off to the sides and get away from everything. Definitely. Do you Which I, I believe I believe a lot of them go up there and chase the schools of bait that go up in there. Some of the older gentlemen that have told me they like to go after they swim all that time in the bay and get up into the river, they like to go up on the flats and kind of take a break out of the current while they're waiting to shoot up the river. But I primarily believe they're up there chasing bait. So do you troll primarily that lower stretch of the river? Would you go all the way up by the Z bridge or anything like that and still troll? I've never trolled that far up, but I've trolled all I've trolled all the way up to, you know, south end of Bay City and caught fish all the way down the edges of the river. I've caught them, you know, 
anywhere from five to ten foot, but it seems I try to get out in the channel and try to troll for them. I don't have as much luck as I do getting up there in that shallow water. Do you th- do you think you know that you you said they're they're chasing bait and that makes complete sense? As we were catching all these real tiny walleye the other day, I was wondering, do you think the big walleye actually feed on the smaller walleye too? I don't think the walleyes do, but definitely the pike that we had the other day, the the biggest one we had was 40 and a half inches, and when we cut them open, he had six baby walleyes in his belly. Oh, no kidding. So, so the big the big northern pike are definitely eating the baby walleyes, and the walleyes were mostly filled with uh, shad. Were the pike, were they male or female? All females. All females. Yep. Oh, man, it... it uh... It just looked like it looked like so much fun what you guys were into. I'm like that. That is pretty cool. Oh uh, yeah, you know, usually when we troll it, we'll get two or three pike, but we must have hit the school just right that day, Mike. And it was pretty crazy. I don't know. In the couple hours we fished, we landed fourteen or fifteen great big <laughs> ones, and it was definitely a definitely a riot. So again, I want to make sure how you. I understand how you do this. You're you're searching the the shallow side of the boat with your side scan, or are you looking out to both sides? I'm looking off to both sides. I mean, you'll see schools on both sides, but you'll see up in that shallow edge, you'll see those great big marks laying up in there. And, you know, on the on the channel side, you'll see smaller marks laying in there, which are your littler walleyes that you see the guys are chicken for. And, you know, I'm looking just for schools up there where I can troll and get my baits to. And... You know, we were only running our baits back past the board, you know, 10 to 15 foot, just like you and Mark were doing in the bay. Yeah. Um, that side scan is something else, isn't it? All it is, it's the technology is, nowadays is crazy. Have you tried the new stuff, the, the forward, or the panoptics or whatever? You've tried that? Yep, I have the live scope for ice fishing. I use it on... My river boat for jigging, it's uh, it's pretty crazy, you know. A lot of people like to call it cheating. I like to call it video game fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it's not cheating. You still got to catch the fish. <laughs> oh, yeah, you do. Do you do uh, ice fishing trips? I used to. I don't anymore. Me and my dad do the, the recoveries out here. He owns TK and Sun Ice Recovery, and I'm the main guy who's down there hooking up the machines on the uh, bottom. Uh, hey, listen, I, boy, I hate to ambush you with this, and I don't mean to, to do this, but I heard a rumor that Coast Guard Station Saginaw River is going out of the recovery business. And he, I mean, you would know. They're not going – they're they're moving their airboats up towards Tawas, I believe, if this is what I heard. Yeah. And uh, they're going to station out of Tawas now, and the Saginaw River is not going to do – the ice rescues, it's going to be, I believe it's going to be more helicopter based instead of the airboats. Well, that's going to open up so, some, uh, some uh, business for you guys. Yeah, definitely. Which, which the Coast Guard never did, did recoveries, you know. I mean, they just go out and get the people. They don't get their gear. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. So that was always up to you guys to get the gear. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, you know, typically don't go out and get the people. We just get their gear after uh, the Coast Guard goes out and grabs them. Well, Brandon, I tell you, it was a lot of fun watching you guys that day, and it kind of opened my eyes to different ways to uh, fish that river and different fish to target. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you get that big Grady White in there, and I'll say hi when I go by on the Angler Quest. For sure. Thanks for having me, Mike. Brandon, uh, Brandon it's a uh, pleasure. Brandon Corthell of uh, Buckwild Charters. By the way, his website is buckwildcharters.com. That's buckwildcharters.com. And I was hoping that day I saw him out there to – to uh, to get some pictures of him with those fish. But I thought, well, I don't want to interrupt their fishing here, but I sure wanted to sneak uh, Mark's boat up in there and their spread and get some pictures of the fish because, man, it looked like an awful lot of fun. All right, we'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. We will switch gears, head to northern Michigan, and uh, target a fish that most people have never even caught. It's kind of an ugly fish, but I hear it's a really good-tasting fish, and it's called a burbot. Bob Hines of Central Coast Angling is on him right now. We'll talk to him about that, and we'll wrap up the hour with Ben Nielsen of Showspan with details on their big Grand Rapids show coming up already next week. (laughs) 
you can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Port here on WPHM 1380 AM. You can hear us in Muskegon, WKBZ 1090 AM. And north of the bridge in Newberry, WNBY 1450 AM. Speaking of north of the bridge, this segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by this. That's the sound of my Rapid River knife opening up. You know that. I carry a Rapid River knife all the time. I, I, I think a knife is one of the most valuable tools an outdoor enthusiast can carry. Anybody can carry. Uh, I like Rapid River. They're handmade by craftsmen in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. If you get a chance, stop by their showroom on US 2 just east of Rapid River. You'll see what I mean. If you can't make it up there, go to the website rapidriverknifeworks.us. That's rapidriverknifeworks.us. And uh, order one for yourself. Get them engraved. Lifetime guarantee. You order a Rapid River knife, you've got it until you lose it. If you lose it. I'm not losing this one. RapidRiverKnifeWorks.us. Okay, from, from trolling walleye and pike on the Saginaw River, we're going to head north now to talk with Bob Hines of Central Coast Angling. Bob has been on the show here before. We've talked to him. Oh, he fishes for just about everything. You might know him as the guy who catches jumbo perch. Well, now he's into something else. Bob, welcome back to the show. How are you? Great. Good morning, Mike. What are you fishing for now, Bob? The couch. (laughs) No, I don't mean right at this particular minute. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we had a little bit of a change of weather the last uh, 12 hours. Man, I guess Uh, as we are recording this show, Mother Nature just went crazy. She's being mean. I was wearing sunglasses. I got a sunburn yesterday. I was out uh, fishing burbot on uh, one of the inland lakes here in northern Michigan. So, burbot. That's an yeah. interesting <laughs> fish. Uh, what? What? I, I saw, and this is what made me call you. I, I saw a picture of somebody holding a beautiful burbot. Really nice fish they caught with you. And I don't know. They 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 just they look weird. They just but but they're fun to catch and they're good prehistoric. eating, right? Prehistoric. That's a great word. Yes. So, thank you. Yeah, they're a uh, fish that's very sought after, uh, mostly because of the table fare, but they're also a very, I I don't want to say the word elusive, because they're not hard to catch by any means, if you know how to do it, Um, but they're sought after to catch. A lot of people, it's on their bucket list to catch them. Uh, Most people, they get out on the ice to catch them. Well, the last two years, we haven't really had much ice, so we're putting the boat in the water and pretty much going out and hooking them up every trip. It's been a little bit of a grind to get going here, but yesterday we actually did get our first fish of the day was just absolutely, I I haven't posted the picture yet. I'll try to get it up on the Facebook page for everybody to see, but it had been a good solid nine, nine and a half pound fish is one of the bigger bourbon that I've had. And uh, the guy had never seen one and he was just like, Whoa, I got one. And I'm like, yep. Very neat. (laughs) So how do you catch them? Do you jig for them or troll or what? You jig. If you, I, you know, this is great for the Detroit River guys, the Saginaw River guys. If you can jig walleye, it's pretty much the same cadence as jigging a walleye. It's just maybe a touch more aggressive on the upstroke. You never feel them going down because they, they do lay really close to bottom. I mean, basically on bottom. They levitate every once in a while. They'll come up like a foot or two, and you'll see them on the sonar. But they're right on the bottom. Actually, yesterday, we got we. I just put a post on my Instagram on my story about when we smacked it right on the bottom of the chin. So a lot of times you do get them on the bottom of the chin. Sometimes it's right in the uh, right down the gullet. Um, what I mean, I'm not asking for your honey hole, but these are all inland lakes. Or you, you're not out in the big water doing this, are you? I'm getting them out on the bay too. Yeah, the Grand Traverse Bay you is a great okay. fishery for them. Uh, they're yep, yep. They're a little bit tricky to find on the bay. There are some uh, spots that we've caught them over the years, and we kind of stay quiet about that. And it's it's a complete timing thing with these fish. It doesn't matter if you're on Inland Lake or Grand Traverse Bay. The best time to catch these fish is pre-spawn. And actually, if you can get on a spawning school, they all bunch up kind of like carp. They get on top of each other and they're act they're actually feeding they're biting while they're spawning so you like for instance i had the grillos with me last year we had a spawning school and i think in 90 minutes we hooked up like 70 80 some fish 
the Grillos, of course, the Grillo family of Michigan brand meats, good friend of the Outdoor Magazine show. You know, I was thinking, Bob, you said you were trying to keep this kind of quiet. If you're trying to keep this quiet, you don't go on the Mike Avery uh, radio show, you know? Oh, I don't mind. I don't mind. It's good for business, and I want to help, you know, more than anything, I've always said I'm an instructor. I want to help people... uh I want to help people catch fish. So a lot of times I get guys like I'm booked every day right now. I'm squeezing these burbot trips in and guys will ask me, I'll just be like, Hey, you know, like go check this area right here. Maybe take this bait and maybe launch here and go have fun. So a lot of these spots like, you know, mullet, um, some of the lakes we have them are uh, torch Lake mullet, crystal Lake and grand Traverse Bay. These are pretty classic spots to catch burbot. So it, if you just do a little bit of recon, if you're a good fisherman, you're going to be able to go out and have success on your own. And as far as baits go, you know, we can talk baits real quick. Um, real trout quick. and pout is, yep, trout and pout. Um, a five inch tube, like a bass tube, white is great. Uh, Swedish pimples work. You can put down a minnow and dead stick it on a spare rod if that thing takes off i've caught them on salmon skein before fishing for white fish so are, you, are, you, are you, you still fishing jumbo perch too yeah i got a, i got a trip uh <laughs> i think the next three days so actually i'm towing my boat everywhere right now across northern michigan i'll Every let you go bob i appreciate trip. that bob hines of central coast angling central coast angling.com you want to fish perch you want to fish burbot just about anything else in northern Michigan, Bob is your guy. We'll take a break. When we come back, Ben Nielsen of Showspan right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Tawas. On WIOS, that's 1480 AM, 106.9 FM. You can hear us in Traverse City on WTCM, 580 AM, and north of the bridge in Marquette on WDMJ, 1320 AM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Killer Food Plots, Michigan-based family-owned Killer Food Plots. It's a little early to start putting them in, but it's not too early to start thinking about it. In fact, coming up in our next hour, Rich Krizan of Killer Food Plots will join me to help uh, get you going that direction and putting a plan together. Their website, KillerFoodPlots.com. That's KillerFoodPlots.com. Well, it is show season here in Michigan. The big outdoor rama show in Novi was a big success. And now, all of a sudden, before we even realize it, the Grand Rapids show is coming up. This is the show, the show span show that I love. This is a show that I used to go to literally 50 years ago, more than that, with my dad, he used to take me down to that show when I was a kid. It looks a lot different now than it did then, in part to guys like Ben Nielsen. Ben is with Showspan with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Ben, welcome back. Yes, thank you for having me. You didn't even get a break. You didn't get a chance to catch your breath. The Outdoor Rama show is barely in the rearview mirror, and you got Grand Rapids coming up now. Well, you are right about that. There's no doubt. There, there's not a lot of time in between them this year, um, you know, but... We're ready to go. You know, this is what we do, and we've been planning it all year. And so uh, everything's looking really, really good for Grand Rapids this year. Is this really the, I mean, all the shows are great, but I feel like this is the crown jewel of show span. You know, it kind of is, or the granddaddy of yes, them all. You yes, know, we use the, the Rose Bowl reference, right, with football and everything. But, uh, you know, we're in our 79th year, mm. um, which is which is incredible. And, you know, the sports show in Grand Rapids obviously has a long tradition. Uh, and it is, you know, definitely one of my favorites, too, because just like I heard you say, my dad brought me to the trout pond when I was a little kid. <laughs> so I have all these great memories of, of going to the trout pond and, you know, seeing all the different things at the sports show. How is this one different? Is it just a bigger scale? Well, it is larger. There's no doubt about that. I mean, we filled the Voss place up and, you know, we're going to have, you know, a lot of those same features. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of our great seminars are going to be back again this year with, you know, kind of our key seminar leaders. We do have Mark Zona there this year. He's not there every year, which is kind of a, a great addition to the show. Uh, and, you know, we've got the Lumberjack show back again this year, which is a great hit for the whole family. Uh, so a lot of those same features are going to be back and uh, a lot of the things that everybody wants to see. Do you consider this a fishing show, Ben, or a combo show or what? How do you see it? You know, I will tell you, I mean, it's a sports show, so we talk hunting and fishing. There's more fishing in here than there is hunting. 
Um, and that's really just kind of based on time of the year. Sure. Uh, you know, when we, we look at March and although we obviously have some great turkey hunting coming up and we're still doing, you know, probably a little bit of predator stuff. Um, the main thing right now is fishing. You know, even everybody that loves to hunt is thinking about, you know, going out walleye fishing, going out bass fishing, you know, big lake fishing. I mean, all that stuff is kind of right around the corner. And so it just naturally has a little bit more of an emphasis on fishing because of that. So does this wrap up the year for you guys? Or are you doing, now doing boat shows and golf shows and home shows and that type of thing? We do still have a couple more shows for the company. Uh, but by the end of March, everything is wrapped up. I can't imagine the work that goes into these. There's a lot there, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, all of the different planning throughout the year, all the great exhibitors that we work with and, you know, then the operation side of moving the show in and moving it out. And, uh, but, you know, um, we do it every year. We've got a lot of planning involved and a lot of great people here on the team that, uh, that make it all happen. So give us the details of this big Grand Rapids show. Absolutely. We open up, uh, you know, March 7th um, and go through the 10th. Um, you know, admission is $12. Uh, children 6 to 14 are 5 five and under are free. Uh, and if you're anything like me, you probably would have forgot everything I just said there. So you can go to ultimate sports show.com for all those details. Ultimate sports show.com. That's a great name for this. The ultimate sports show, because it is indeed the ultimate sports show. And uh, actually parking downtown. There's not bad. There's a big ramp right across the street too. Yeah. There's a ramp across the street. There's a ramp right underneath the facility as well. Uh, and we do have, uh, you know, a dash service there as well, um, you know, for when things get filled up, uh, you know, and it really is a, a pretty easy place to navigate in downtown Grand Rapids. UltimateSportsShow.com. Ben, keep up the uh, great work, and uh, you and I will talk again. All right. Sounds great. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thank you, Ben Nielsen of Showspan. Showspan.com. And the website for the Ultimate Sports Show is UltimateSportsShow.com. And as I say, there's a reason it's called the Ultimate Sports Show, right? This is kind of the it, – it wraps up the season. And and as I told Ben, I, I, I have memories of when it was the old – I think it was – was it the Pantland Hotel? It was in years and years ago. Uh, going down there as a kid, and it was just – it was – you know, being a little farm boy from northern Kent County to go down to the city and then to see an event like this that is all outdoor related, outdoor oriented. And there were fishing rods and there were baits and there's lures and there were people talking and there were just a lot of excitement. And my dad used to go down there and he'd stock up on some supplies for the year because there are good deals at a show like this. The prices are good. You know, if you want to get something uh, uh, at, a, at a good price. Uh, this is the place to do it, ultimatesportshow.com. We will take a break for the uh, top of the hour. When we come back in our second hour, we're going to head over to the east side of the state, the Lake St. Clair River specifically, that general area, and talk with Captain Pete Pat Salas of Hook One Charters. I want to talk with Pete about the fishing over there this time of year, but also, as I was uh, checking in with him yesterday, he told me he's in an interesting situation himself. He's selling his boat. He had a boat that he really, really liked, but he's ready to move on to a, a bigger boat now. So he's saying he's in the process of selling this thing. I said, why did we get you on the air to talk not about fishing, but also about how do you sell a boat and how do you buy a new one? Because, man, there's a lot of choices out there, and these things are expensive these days. And then Rich Krizan of Killer Food Plots will join me to wrap up the hour. And looking ahead to hour number three, Jamie Gretzinger of Michigan Out of Doors TV and, of course, Wild Game Chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner coming up in hour two of Outdoor Magazine. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay's Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons, the Forward Corporation, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, this is the big guy, Mike Avery. Thank you, Ken Hunter, for that introduction. It's interesting. I was going through some old video archives the other day from uh, Outdoor Magazine TV shows, and Ken Hunter was the voice of those to uh, do the introduction to the show. And I'm talking years and years and years and years ago. So it's good that uh, Ken and I are still 
in touch, and it's good that we're still here. Welcome to our number two of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show here on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on more than 30 radio stations across the great state of Michigan. And I do believe the best way to listen to the show, if you can, is on your local AM or FM station. Uh, If you can't, you know, if your local affiliate doesn't carry all three hours of the show, most of ours do, but a couple of them that don't doesn't carry all three hours of the show, or if you live in some part of the state not covered by the broadcast signal, the broadcast radio show, it's nice to know that there's a podcast version of the show available. Now, podcasting is everything, right? If you see or hear, most people, not you, okay, if the general public sees or hears any kind of content these days, they just assume it's a podcast even though in the case of this show, it originated as a radio show. It is recorded, produced, syndicated, distributed, yada, 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 as a radio show. But if you can't listen to the radio version, isn't it nice to know that there's a podcast version available? It's the same content. It's just available somewhere other than your local radio station. Where do you hear it? You can hear it on my website, MikeAbreyOutdoors.com. It's on my Facebook page, Amazon Music, Audible, Twitter, X, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. Through the whole gamut. If you can hear a podcast, any podcast, at a given destination, you can probably hear the Outdoor Magazine podcast. I even put it on YouTube. Uh, just doing an audio version. It's not a video version, but it's on YouTube as well. I do like podcasting, though. Uh, each month I do podcasts for Offshore Tackle, um, Angler Quest Boats. When uh, Mr. Angler Quest Brad gets up and running and gets, his, uh, gets the new model and such, we'll start doing monthly Angler Quest podcasts again. And I also do podcasts for Primal Outdoors, you know, Primal Tree Stands, Primal Ground Blinds. In fact, when we're done recording this week's radio show, we'll do this month's Primal podcast this time with Bill Hahn of Jay's Sporting Goods. Jay's is a, a big retailer of Primal, so I'm looking forward to that conversation. Regardless of how you are hearing me, when you are hearing me, thank you so very much. I've been doing this a long time. I hope to do it for a long time yet, but I wouldn't be able to without um, being blessed by God and being supported by you. If you weren't listening, there would be no reason I wouldn't be able to do the show. So thank you so very, very much. You heard me talking in the first hour about my um, experience on the Saginaw River, Saginaw Bay here last week. Uh, Caught a window of opportunity when the weather was absolutely perfect, trolling the skinny water of the bay, went up the river and did some jigging. And it was so nice to be out there in February. I realize as you're hearing this show now, it's March, but be out there in February. It was wonderful. There is some great springtime fishing all across our state. I want to turn our attention now to the east side of the state, the St. Clair River specifically and more, to talk with Captain Pete Pat Salas uh, of Hook One Charters, HookOneCharters.com. Uh, Pete, welcome back to the show. How are you? What's going on, Mike? It's a pleasure to be back, man. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Listen, talk, speaking of podcasting, you do a podcast as well, and it looks like it's getting a great, uh, great response. It's it's starting to catch on, man. Yeah, we started we started the hook one pod. Actually, me and Louie started doing it just on a laptop behind the counter because we were so slow at the shop when we first opened. Um, and now we've got it on YouTube and stuff. And we talk a lot of fishing on the east side, we try and have some guests on and, and help anglers cut their learning curve when they get over here to this river. I think you're such an interesting guy, Pete. You're, you know, from my perspective, you're a younger guy, but you're you're a charter captain. You also started a tackle shop right there on the river, the only one in the area. I, I think you were a genius to do that. How's it going? It's going really well. Uh, I was really nervous to start. I never had any experience in the retail side of things. Luckily, we've got some, like everything, man, we've got some really good guys on our side. We've got a good team behind us um, that helped us kind of navigate the retail world. But the big thing is we don't really have a lot of stuff over here. You know, we've got – um, two bait shops up in Port Huron. We've got a small bait and tackle shop in Elginac, but a lot of that stuff is homemade hand-tied stuff there. And he does a good job, um, but that's about it. And we've got 42 miles of river um, to cover people with. So we got lucky. We got a great spot on the water where guys can pull their boat up to, but it's also a great spot. We've got our cleaning station here. We run our charters out of here. Um, 
So it's, it's been going well, and it seems like it's starting to catch on. So we're ready for a busy spring. Well, and as you look out on the river right now, what are you seeing? Are there boats out there? Is there <laughs> what's it look like? No, there's nobody out there um, yet. It's, it's blowing about 25 miles an hour. 25 miles an hour out of the west, so the Canadian shoreline's getting beat up pretty bad. Um, but I'll tell you what, the water looks good. It's clean. It's not muddied up. Uh, it's cold. It's 35 degrees. Um, but we should be a couple weeks here from seeing some salmon start trickling in the system, and then those resident walleye should start snapping as well. That's the cool thing about your rivers. I, I feel like you don't know what you're going to catch out there. I remember you even got into Atlantics one time. Yeah, you know, this this year we've actually had more luck on Atlantic um, than anything else, and it's a really weird fish because I, I talk to a, I talk to a lot of guys that fish Atlantic from, you know, St. Mary's down, and we have all come to the same kind of conclusion. You just can't pattern them. It, mm. it's, it's very hard. That we've caught them in 35-degree um, water, and we've caught them in 65-degree water in this river. Um, we've caught them on big crankbaits. We've caught them on tiny spoons. It's just a... They're a, they're a weird fish, but they are so fun. Um, they fight super hard, and they're great table fare. How do you fish that river, Pete? I mean, it's a big river. It's you got a, you got a deep channel. you got a lot of current. I think that can be intimidating for somebody who's not used to it. Yeah, it's definitely different. We get a lot of guys that come, you know, they'll fish the Saginaw River a lot, which, I mean, right now is on fire. Um, they fish the Detroit River a lot, and then they come over here, um, and, and you notice the water color is going to be a lot different. You know, sometimes you can see 15, 20 feet down, um, especially early in the spring. We're fishing really deep, which I will say in Detroit, a lot of guys are starting to fish really deep, those, those drifts in between the bridges of deep water and whatnot. Um, but typically out here you're fishing deep too, so heavier jigs. Um, but it, it, we fish it the same way, man. We, we vertical jig a lot. We pull a lot of bottom bouncers. Um, when we're salmon fishing, we're trolling downstream a lot. Um, it, there, there's a lot of opportunity. It's, it's hard to touch it all, you know. I was talking to uh, Captain Brandon Corthall, uh about, he, he was trolling the Saginaw River for walleye. He happened to get into a bunch of big pike, but I asked him the question, does it matter if you troll upstream or down? You know, there's uh, there, uh, days on the Saginaw River where there's almost no current. You never run into that. So which direction do you like to troll on the St. Clair River? Always um, when we're trolling like boards and baits, always down. When you're talking about like handline trolling and doing stuff like that, there's there's some spots in flat current where you can use some three way rigs and pull boards against the current, but those spots are very few and far between. Ninety nine percent of the time, you're trolling. We're trolling down current. Um, we're trying to go a little bit faster than the current, which means sometimes it's not it's not often to be getting close to three and a half miles an hour by the time you start scooting down. <laughs> that's uh, that's the moving the way it is. So. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're flying, and a lot of the times we're fishing. We like to fish. We like to try and get close to structure. So, you know, you've got a planer board going off the edge of the docks at four miles an hour. <laughs> it keeps it interesting. <laughs> Why is hand? You mentioned hand lining. Why is that so effective? It's it's the best way. It's it's really the best way to present a bait to a fish in a river system. Whether it be the Saginaw River where you downsize your weight, or you go to Detroit or here, you're going you're going against the current so slow that the, you can leave the bait in that fish's face for so long. So if you know that there's a good school of fish there, um, whether you're looking for numbers or big fish, especially in dirty water, that bait's moving, it's rattling, where, you know, when we're jigging or casting or doing whatever, our baits are, are they're moving pretty quickly past the fish, um, you know, relatively to what the fish is thinking, where when you're hand lining and trolling, it's a totally different presentation. You can use totally different baits than you would if you were pulling bottom bounces or if you were jigging. Um, and a lot of the times those baits have a lot of movement. They've got a lot of action and you can really just serve it right in front of their face like a snack because you're moving so slow. And the guys that have been doing that for years are just masters at it, aren't they? It's unbelievable, man. It, it, it's literally, it's an art. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I would say when we first opened in 2021, so obviously not very long ago, when we first opened, I would, I would have told you it was a dying art. And I, and I was sad about that, worried about it, because it is such an effective way to catch fish. Because the thing is, is you've got, you know, anywhere from one to two pounds of weight on that line. And you're running three baits at, at three different, you know, you've got 40 foot, 20 foot, five or 10 foot. Some guys will run baits off the very bottom there. Um, 
But I would say it's it's not dying. There's a lot of people getting back into it. They're spending good money to get back into it. Handline reels are expensive because of what they are and how they're built. I mean, they're a very technical machine. Um, and so it's cool to see it coming back. We've got guys coming back buying, you know, a ton of floating repalas, spoons, pencil plugs, like the old wood pencil plugs, if you're familiar with those. It, it's cool to see it coming back. Oh, that is cool. We're talking with Captain Pete Pat Salas of Hook One Charters, hookonecharters.com, hookonecharters.com. If you go to the website, you can learn about Pete's uh, charter business. You can learn about the store. You can learn about the podcast as well. We've got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, I want to talk to Pete about an interesting process he's going through right now that a lot of others uh, of us have gone through as well. Selling your old boat and buying a new one, there's a lot of money wrapped up in that. What's the best way to go about it? We'll find out more after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Battle Creek on WBCK. That's 95.3 FM. You can hear us in Cairo on two stations, WKYO, 1360 AM, and WIDL, 92.1 FM. And you can hear us north of the bridge in the Sioux on WKNW 1400. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Matt Smith Outdoors. Matt, a good friend of mine. Uh, and he's also an expert at finding recreational properties and vacation homes. And he can help you turn your family's dream into a reality. Like, have you, have you wanted this place up north? Have you wanted lakefront property? Are you looking for, um, you know, hunting land? Whatever it is, Matt can help you out. You can find him online at Matt Smith Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. That's Matt Smith Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. And by the way, if you're looking for a new home as your primary residence, Matt can help you out there as well. Again, that's Matt Smith Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram. While you are online, please check out my website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. From there, you can get to my Oh, my social media outlets, my YouTube channel, the different podcasts we're doing. Also, head on over to hookonecharters.com, hookonecharters.com, the website of Captain Pete Pat Salas. Uh, and Pete, you find yourself now in an interesting situation. You and I have talked before on the uh, Polar Craft podcast when we were doing that, and you had a Polar Craft that you really liked. But now I understand you find yourself in a situation where you're looking for something uh, a, a little bit different. Walk me through this process. Pete, how did you get to, to this point here? Yeah, man. So I was running the Outlander 2010, the center council. So it was a, it was a really good boat, 21 foot boat. We did a lot of river fishing. Um, and as far as like a fun boat, a utility boat, a boat for a, a group of guys that are willing to fish, it was honestly bulletproof. Like we were really fortunate. Um, we were able to fish a lot of waters, do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, an aluminum boat's an aluminum boat. Um, when you have a center council boat, it's tough when your clients are the ones without the windshield. So we had to kind of take a step back. We started running a lot longer runs out to Lake St. Clair. Um, that boat that we had only had a 23-gallon gas tank. So we needed to have more range. We needed to have more speed. Um, so we finally decided, you know, we're going to go into it. And, you know, Mike, the other thing is this is something now we've been doing it two years um, full – full bore um and going you know every day when you're out there every day you've got to be comfortable so we decided to go into a glass boat we're getting into a skeeter 2060 um the layout of the boat fits us really well we'll talk about it in a minute obviously but the layout of the boat fits us really well for what we want to do it gives us a lot more range i'm i've had great luck with my yamaha motors um so it was a big reason i wanted to stick with yamaha and run yamaha motor um and we cannot wait. We take delivery of it next week. Then the rigging process begins, because um, obviously when it comes from the dealer, usually it has a graph or an, and a trolling motor, but why only have one graph? So we've got to get some more graphs on it. We've got to get all our tackle in the boat. got to get it for a charter captain. We've got to get it inspected, um, which we're on the list and ready to go for that. And then we'll be ready to go, man. But it's, it's a doozy of a process. <laughs> How exciting is that time when you're waiting for a new boat, though? 
I'll tell you what, it's extremely exciting, but when you're sitting on another one, it's very nerve wracking until that one is sold. <laughs> so, so, so how, listen, uh, what, what, what is the, what's the market out there these days for a good used boat? Are they, are people looking for them? Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy, man. In my opinion, it, it's fairly flooded just from what I see on Facebook and, and I, I keep track on marketplace and stuff. It looks like, it looks like a lot of boats, used boats, are going into the market. A lot of boats that are a year or two old, um, which has me kind of thinking either guys are running their boats for a year or two and flipping them um, and getting into new boats, or maybe guys got into it over COVID and they didn't think they were going to like it as much, or now that we're kind of back to normal life and how that stuff goes, maybe they don't have the time. Um, there's a lot of new boats out there. I've also spent a lot of time at the boat shows, and there's a lot of new boats for unbelievable prices out there. If you can find, you know, uh, a year, a non-current, basically, like a year before, right? If you can mm-hmm. find a 23 somewhere, um, a lot of these companies have killer rebates. You still get your warranty on them and stuff. So there's a lot, there's a lot to look at. There's obviously a lot that goes into the process. Um, a big thing that was for me was sitting down. What are we going to do a lot with it? And like, what are we going to use it for? Because really I, I, I've had the, I've been in that just about every boat. It's a big, it's a big investment, right? Like no matter what, no matter whether you're buying a new boat or a used boat right now, they're expensive. Um, so one is you should really look at every boat you can and, and look at the layout of it. And look how the storage is laid out, how the motors are laid out, how the cockpit's laid out, how you're going to drive the helm, you know, all that stuff when you're making an investment like that. Um, and then really figuring out what you're going to utilize it for, trolling, jigging, you know, are you going to be fishing out of the back of the boat, front of the boat, stuff like that. Because really every boat has, there, there's, there's so many of them, and they all do a good job. So you got to figure out what fits you the best. Okay, this, so then getting rid of the polar craft, uh, do you sell that with everything on it that you had, or do you strip it down, or how does that work? I did, man. I did. I, I, I really, I was motivated to sell. Um, so my boat ended up going with, I put a brand new 36 volt 112 Tarova on it, um, a 72 inch shaft. So that stayed on it. I, a Garmin 12 inch screen with a live scope unit stayed on it. Um, two of my hummingbirds stayed on it. My, my 48 inch birch track stayed on it. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, obviously it increases the value of the boat a little bit. If you can get someone a boat that, Hey, all you need to do is turn the key and go fishing. Um, that's, that's important. And the other thing is, Mike, you, and this is for anyone out there that's, that's looking to sell a boat, you can't option a boat enough to make it expensive. So it didn't matter that I put the new Minn Kota on there. It didn't matter that I have, you know, the Garmin on there. You're not going to be able to get, you know, $40,000, $50,000 for a used, you know, in my case, for a four-year-old used guide boat. It doesn't matter the electronics I have on it. Um, so that's another way that if you're going to sell a boat, Maybe take the electronics off, and it'll lower the price of your boat. You can either use your electronics on the next boat or sell them, you know, on Facebook and get more money for them. But it's, it's, there's a fine line to walk there, you know? Yeah. Well, then, if somebody's going to spend good money on a, on a used boat, too, I suspect, at least if it was me, I'm going to want to take that thing for a ride, too. I'm going to want to get on the water with it. <laughs> yeah. So last week when we sold ours, it was 32 degrees when we went on our test ride. Um, and today we're actually heading on a test ride when we hang up and it's, there's, it went from about 50 to 30 and it's, it's windy out there, but you <laughs> yeah. know what? The guy has to see the boat. Sure. Sure. <laughs> He's got to see the boat. He's got to see that it works. And here's the deal. The other part of it is I know, I know the equipment that we've got. I know what we're using. I know the equipment we got. I know it can handle the elements. So if this guy comes out to look at the boat and sees that it'll drive and everything works good and it's not going to get busted up in these conditions. You're going to be just fine in April when it's sunny, you know what I mean, and water's yeah, calm. Yeah. You talk about rigging a new boat, too. Man, that, that is, today, with the electronics and the gear and the accessories, that is a big deal. It's a huge deal, man. Um, and, and to be honest with you, a lot of guys, I, I say a lot of guys waste their money, and the only reason I say they waste their money is because we have a ton of money into electronics. You know how much it costs to get into electronics. And so if you're going to spend that money on electronics, you should really take two days out of your season to learn those electronics. 
and then you wouldn't be wasting your money because they can do so much and they can help you out so much. But I have so many guys come in the bait store because, you know, there's so many guys on YouTube and Instagram, you know, you need pan optic this, you need HDS live this, you know, you need this. And they ask me, like, what do you think? And I ask, what are you doing? What are you fishing? Are you just vertical jigging? Most of the time they say, yes, no, you don't need it. You know, I think it's trying to figure out what you need and what, what you're going to use and then maximize it that way because it is expensive. Like, no matter what way you want to cut it, even if you want to buy a chip to put, you know, mapping in your system, it's expensive for that, for that chip. So you've got so much money into electronics, you want to make sure that you know how to use them and that you're going to use them and they're going to be practical. Because for some people, you might need live scope. For some people, you know, you might just need Mega 360 if you're fishing a lot of shallow structures, something like that. Maybe you just need Mega 360. And for some guys, like a lot of the locals out here, really all you need to know is depth and water temperature and they're going to catch them. <laughs> when, when you so, say when you say take a couple days out of your fishing to learn your electronics, do you mean spending time on the water, at the helm, in front of that screen, and not fish? Just learn how to run it, learn how to use it. Day one, day one, you don't even put a rod in the boat. Don't oh, that's tough. That is so hard. You can't. You can't. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. If you if you don't do it and you bring that rod you're automatically going to be like, oh, well, I want to see what a lure looks like. <laughs> I know, I know. And then you don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so if you don't bring that rod and you're, like, if you're trying to figure out live scope, go set up somewhere like on a seawall or where there's dock pilings and, and for 45 minutes to an hour, mess with the settings, mess with the live scope, and you don't even need to put a lure in the water. You're going to, I promise you, you're going to see the lure. Um, same thing with like side imaging and stuff like that. Like I don't practice side imaging when we're trolling. I practice side imaging when I'm at a decent speed out in the lake. You know, I have a good buddy of mine that smallmouth fishes and he'll spend, he'll spend three days without a rod and he'll just graph trying to find spots when it comes up to tournament days and stuff like that. Um, but the better you learn your graph, the more it's going to help you. All right. Before I let you go here, I want to follow up anywhere. Well, I want to follow up on a couple of things. With with electronics, the way they change these days, they're always coming out, they're new, they're improving, and the companies would have us believe that we have to upgrade every year to get the newest and the greatest. Man, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, how many years do you think you can get out of a piece of electronics before you have to upgrade? Um, again, I think it has a lot to do with kind of like what you're utilizing it for and what you're using it for, but I know guys that have you know, 2016 Lawrence's in their boat, and they have no problem marking fish on Lake Erie, and all they do is troll. So then why upgrade? You know what I mean? You're almost at 10 years with that thing. Why upgrade? And I know the electronic companies want to say that, and a lot of guys say it. Well, they're getting paid by the electronic company. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even, like, on my old boat, we ran the old live scope, the LVS-32, and we had no problem, you know, marking fish and marking salmon over the walleye schools. So it, you, you can definitely make it work. Pete, always a pleasure. Good luck with the new boat. Have fun. Good luck with the shop and uh, this spring's charter trips, and uh, I'll check in with you again soon. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Have a good one. Always a pleasure. Captain Pete Pat Salas of Hook One Charters. HookOneCharters.com is the website, HookOneCharters.com. If you go to that website, you can learn more about Pete's tackle shop right there, right there on the water. I mean, how cool is that? Um, And also his uh, podcast, which is pretty cool as well. We'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine Show. When we come back, we're going to switch gears again. This time, we're going to talk to Rich Krizan of Killer Food Plots. I know you're not putting in food plots yet, but it's not too far off, and it's certainly not too early to start thinking about it. And at our number two, Michigan Out of Doors TV show host, Jimmy Gretzinger, plus Chef Dixie Dave Miner. Outdoor Magazine show in Sheboygan on Big Country Gold, WCBY, 1240 AM, 100.7 FM. You can hear us in Flint on WTRX, 1330 AM. And you can hear us in uh, Escanaba, the Riviera of the North, on WCHT, 600 AM, 93.5 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by the Linwood Beach Marina and Campground. Linwood Beach can be your year-round Saginaw Bay fishing destination. Beautiful campground, great boat launch, ship store, 
full marine shop. Great selection of boats, great people, great location. What more can you ask as you get ready to get your boat in the uh, water this spring or get a new boat? Think of the folks at Linwood Beach. Or if you're just looking for a place to launch and be your, your base of operation for walleye fishing on the bay. Again, Linwood Beach Marina. The website, linwoodbeachmarina.com. That's linwoodbeachmarina.com. If you're looking at the process, uh, process, the process of food plots, I'm going to recommend, recommend Michigan-based, family-owned Killer Food Plots. Their website, killerfoodplots.com. That's killerfoodplots.com. Rich Krizan, the man behind Killer Food Plots these days, with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Rich, welcome back. How have you been? I've been real good, Mike. And you? I've been real, real good. I can't complain at all. And this that, that spell of warm weather we had there that looked like and felt like springtime got me thinking about food plots uh, I mean, we're not turning dirt yet, but, man, it's it's not that far off, is it? No, no. It, uh, well, I'd like to say no, but yeah, you know yeah. what Mother Nature's going to do, right? Yeah, yeah. 70 degrees yesterday, beautiful sun, and I'm sitting here looking at it snowing today. So um, <laughs> just crazy weather we're having. I mean, I seen you were out on the boat the other day, right? Um, <laughs> it was, not it sure felt good. <laughs> Yeah, wow, it's just, it, you know, yeah, take advantage of it, I guess. We're not going to get the, the cold weather and the freeze, but, um, yeah, I mean, there's frost seeding, right? I kind of, I did some frost seeding just the other day. Um, I had a couple people question, wow, it seems really early. Um, and it does, right? I mean, I usually, anywhere from the middle of February to the end of March is perfect for frost seeding. Um, I, myself, I like to do a little, I like to push the envelope, right? It's, it's my product. Sure. I like to see how it does. Um, I've been real successful frosting in the last week of February, so I pushed it a week early this year uh, to see how it reacts, see how my seed does, so I can pass that on, right? Um, and plus, I really don't know if we're going to get the ground cycle like we had this this past weekend when it was really cold. Um, you know, you need that ground to freeze at night and, and have it heave and create all them voids. Uh, I did a small video and put it on Facebook the other day because the, the ground was perfect for that it was froze it had heaved it had tons of voids for the seeds to fall into um so yeah i, I took advantage of that i did some frost seeding and uh we'll see how it turns out um i'm looking at the weather right now mike i mean we're looking at what 65 68 degrees sunday monday yeah 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 um, it's crazy not even getting full freezing that night so yeah i mean did i jump the gun maybe not i might have been like the last last opportunity to have that good freeze thaw um rotation so yeah it's a uh, it's exciting it, it's this is my busy time right a lot of people are calling doing a lot of property plans um getting ready to get out there and start turning dirt and and when things grow start killing it off so so we're, I, so we're not yeah. jumping the gun by this conversation this is a good time to talk to you yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Right. I mean, get out there and, and get some frost seed and get your the product. You know, go on our our website com and look at our seeds. Clover's a great great one to overseed. Uh, I just freshened up all my clover plots. Um, my Carnage brass plots got pummeled, got turned to dirt by the deer, which is awesome. Um, so that's like a blank a blank slate for me. So I can go out there and I I seed that real hard this time of year and and I'll see how it turns out being as early as it was. Um, can you overseed again, right? Can you overseed right now? Yeah, yeah, yep. So the the deer have devastated my my resurrection clover and my chicory plot um, because there's been no snow to hide it from them, right? So they're like, hey, yeah, this is all season long. This is like a a buffet for us. So <laughs> they've really hit it hard. Uh, there's a lot of bare spots. So I went over and I overseeded um, when it was really cold that morning. You know, if you're gonna frost seed. You want to do it in the morning when the ground is still froze, so them them crevices, the craters are still open in the ground. Let them seeds fall in there, and then when it, like I said earlier, when it thaws, it relaxes and it covers them seed up for you. You know, keeps the birds off them. It's mother mother nature's way of uh, planting it for you. And when she's not trying to dry out in the summertime, she actually can be your friend this time of year. So, so um, is there is there a way yeah. though? Can can you just overseed if you're not frost seeding? If we miss the frost seed window, can you still go out and just throw some seed out? Yeah, you can. Um, you know, I mean, it's like, kind of like your no-till at that point that you would do in the spring. Um, and 
and again, if we're going to get some frost cycles, I'm, I'm sure of it just cause next week looks like it's spring and you could actually start mowing your yard and your lawn. That's what the weather makes it look like. It's still going to get cold. It's still Michigan. I think we're still going to get them a couple of nights where you get that hard freeze and then that warm up cycle. So just keep an eye on the weather and, uh, and take advantage of that. But yes, you can broadcast over your, your existing plots right now. Um, you know, the rain will help, uh, an area like mine, right? The deer density is so high, the deer stomp the seed into the ground for you. So it's like a <laughs> natural. I want to hunt your place. <laughs> <laughs> it's, hang, hang tight, it's Rich. Crazy. We got to take a break. Hey. Here. Uh, we'll talk more about it after the break. We're talking to Rich Krasan of Killer Food Plots. He says the deer decimated my food plot by eating it, and now they're stomping seed into the ground. I want to hunt at Rich Krasan's place. Killerfoodplots.com is the website, killerfoodplots.com. We'll take a break when we come back to this week's Ask Avery segment, and we're asking Rich questions in this week's Ask Avery segment here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Houghton Lake on two stations, the Twister 92.1 WTWS and 98.5 WUPS. You can hear us in Holland, Holland, Michigan, that is, on WHTC 1450 AM, 99.7 FM, and you can hear us in Ludington on News 97, 98, 98.7 WLDM. The Ask Avery segment is brought to you each week by the good folks at Security Credit Union. Security Credit Union loves to work with outdoors men and women, and they can help you with your next outdoor adventure. Check them out online at securitycu.org. That's securitycu.org. The way this segment works is you can send me a question that you would like me to answer directly or something that you would like me to pass along to somebody else. The best way to get those questions to me is to send me an email to mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. That's mike at mikeavoryoutdoors.com. I'm going to be a little preemptive on this week's Ask Avery segment, though, because each year about this time, I start getting questions from people about food plots. And I'm no expert. Believe me, I am not at all. But I know people who are specifically right now. We're talking with Rich Krasan of Michigan-based Killer Food Plots, killerfoodplots.com. So, Rich, some of the questions that people normally ask me that I would forward to you anyway. We're just gonna we're gonna take a shortcut and just do it that way if you don't mind. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so let's start this thing out. What is the number one thing to do if you plan on putting in putting in food plots? Where do you start? Oh, Mike, we know that one. We're going with soil samples. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah, I knew the answer to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I'm surprised that's the first time I said it on this uh, after the talking. So. <laughs> <laughs> we, we went seven minutes and never said soil sample. That's a record. It is. It is. So. A stupid yeah, question, that's Richard. Blueprint, right? <laughs> how, how, all right. If, if I, uh, is it one sample per plot, or how, how do I do that? So, I mean, what I like to do is I like to do a sample in like a one acre area. So if you have a plot that's a full three acres, um, maybe split that into acre increments and and just do a sample for each acre. Um, Definitely, it doesn't have to be an acre. So a lot of people do kill plots in the woods. It's a real small area. You know, if your plots are separated, absolutely do every individual plot because the soil can change from 100 yards one another or even sooner, you know, so. Um, the soil will be different in all different areas. So, yes, I would soil sample every plot you plan on working, for sure. Okay, second question is, what size should a food plot be? Is there a maximum or a minimum? There is not. Um, it really depends on your property. Uh, I got a lot of people that are doing food plots that are 8,000 square foot, and they're very successful in, in their deer hunts in those little plots because they're giving deer what they don't have around them, um, give them a, a variety. You know, Carnage Brassicas are a great blend for that fall that late season deer love it it's not something that grows naturally so once they get acquired to it sometimes they don't need to but once they do man they just pound it so no you can have anywhere from i've done them from 40 acre food plots to like i say 8,000 square foot it really depends on what you have um your area any food plot can be beneficial be productive um you know as long as you 
know what your soil is, right? Go back to question number one, soil sample that, and make sure you're getting the biggest bang for your buck. Um, $22 for a soil sample online, that's the best $20 you're going to spend on that food plot, I guarantee it. So, Question number three, does the shape of the food plot matter? Yes, to me it does. Um, I love a, I love a kidney shaped food plot. Um, you know, so you don't really want a food plot that the deer can walk out and see the entire thing. Uh, if it's a large food plot, you want to break that food plot up, either make it uh, L shaped, a kidney shape, or if it is just a big square field, break it up with border patrol screening. Um, so that way the deer can't walk into one corner and see the entire food plot because that mature buck will will just drift through, look across the food plot, and if there's nothing there, he'll never he'll never come out into the, into the opening during the day, right? He'll stay in the woods, and he knows that food's there at night, so he'll just come out at night when it's safe. So, yeah, you'll see him on your trail uh, cameras, yeah. but not with your eyes. <laughs> exactly. Isn't that the way it usually goes, right? Question see number four. Question, you know? Oh, I know. it. Trail cameras, they're great, but they drive you crazy. It's like, I know he's there. <laughs> Question number four. How do For we sure. know what seed to put in what 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 uh, what blender what seed to plant? Um, you know what really determines that is the amount of sunlight. Uh, you know, some seeds will grow down to two hours of sunlight to full sun. Some need the six hours uh, to full day. So, really, you got to determine how much sunlight your food plot's going to get. Your soil samples will you can go through and pick individual seeds. I usually on ours just pick all eleven seed blends. Uh, maybe your soil needs a ton of amendment for one seed, and it doesn't need that much amendment for another seed. So for cost factors, maybe you go with the lesser um, amendment, you know, save your money on fertilizer, build that soil up, and then eventually you can move on to your brassicas and clovers or whatever else you want to do. So um, yeah, really just there's factors, you know, the sunlight, the soil, um, the size, and it comes down to cost when at the end of the day for a lot of people. Rich, it's always a pleasure. I appreciate you helping me out on this uh, segment, this uh, Ask Avery segment. And it, I, I figure that you and I will be talking again a lot here over the next uh, several weeks as we get closer to putting seed in the ground, if you don't mind. Oh, absolutely, Mike. Um, you know, give me a heads up because I think it was last year I was driving around a property five minutes before trying to find signal, right? And I was like, <laughs> oh, no, this isn't going to work. So, I will uh, give you a heads yeah, up ahead definitely. of time. All right, All right, Rich. Appreciate it. Rich Krasan of Killer Food Plots, Michigan-based, family-owned. Two things that I love. Michigan-based companies, because we're all in this together. Family-owned, uh, like dealing with the people who make the decisions. I don't like uh, dealing with the marketing agencies, but the people who make the decisions. KillerFoodPlots.com, KillerFoodPlots.com. Thank you, Security Credit Union, SecurityCU.org. Time now for Michigan's number one outdoor radio show, Mike Avery's Outdoor Magazine. Mike Avery has covered the outdoors in Michigan for more than four decades, and that tradition continues today. Outdoor Magazine is brought to you by Jay Sporting Goods, the Eider Insurance Group, Angler Quest Pontoons, the Forward Corporation, Primal Outdoors, Security Credit Union, Offshore Tackle, Garber Chevrolet, Rapid River Knife Works, and by Michigan Brand Meats. Now, here's Mike Avery. Indeed, the big guy, Mike Avery, here behind the microphone here in the Outdoor Magazine radio studio to record the third hour of this week's Outdoor Magazine radio show to be heard on the Outdoor Magazine radio network on more than 30 radio stations. There, did I get that all in? <laughs> I know yeah, I know it drives you crazy when I say that because you don't care, do you? You don't care at all. You don't care if you're listening to the broadcast version of the show or the podcast. I get that. I get that. You know, there are a lot of ways to get your outdoor content these days. In fact, I've never seen anything like the way it is today. Whether you are a content producer or just somebody who is a consumer, you like to hear about the outdoors, you like to see the outdoors. A lot of different options these days. And here in our great state of Michigan, uh, a lot of options specifically for our state. But there is one granddaddy of them all. And I don't care if we're talking radio, 
podcasting, broadcasting, TV, social media, whatever it is. The, the grand poobah, when it comes to outdoor coverage here in Michigan, is Michigan Out of Doors TV. It is a tradition going back to Mort Neff. These days, the guy at the helm is Jimmy Gretzinger. And Jimmy has actually been doing the show longer than anybody else ever had. Mort Neff or, or, or any of the other guys. Jimmy's been doing it longer. He does a great job, and he's with us now on the Outdoor Magazine phone line. Jimmy Gretzinger, welcome back to the Outdoor Magazine radio show. How are you, buddy? I am doing well. How are you, young fella? Young fella. I love it when you call me that. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I, I, it's winter again all of a sudden. Oh, man. As we're recording this show, I've been talking about this the entire show. Michigan and Mother Nature this spring has been just absolutely crazy. How has that affected your production schedule, your shooting schedule, Jimmy? Oh, gosh. It's all over the place. We're trying to find ice. We're trying to find something that's going on. We're trying to... It's definitely impacted it quite a bit. You know, we, we finally sent well, one of our crew up to the UP to get some ice fishing. And, you know, it's, it's a long trip to catch a couple pike or a couple bluegill, but you got to go. And, you know, we had a little bit of ice, you know, here, spotty ice over the last month and a half. But then, you know, the rabbit hunting is, you know, there's no snow. So that impacts that. And you can still hunt rabbits, but you can't, you know, trying to get them on camera is hard enough when there's snow, but you put a brown rabbit on brown ground it's uh as you know it's pretty hard to capture that on camera yeah i saw a post of yours here last week where you were talking about just that that you know it was you had a crew in the up and it was almost 70 downstate it's um and 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 i know this firsthand to to try to cover a state like michigan that is so geographically diverse and so um, Climate-wise, you can have a different world in Copper Harbor than you can down in the southern tier of counties, and you got to you got to worry about that too. Yeah, it'd be nice. To, I mean, we are spread out a little bit, but we're spread out in the southern. You know, so I'm over on the west side of the state. Jordan is kind of in the center part of the state near Ionia, and Jenny's over on the east side, uh, kind of north part of Lake St. Clair. But you know, to get one of it'd be nice if we had people stationed in Northern Lower and a couple in the UP and. We're not quite to that. Uh, it'd be nice if we had more reporters, you know, stretched out and camera gear and everything else. But we're not quite to that, quite to that spot. But you know, you never know. That might be something down the road. Hey, you and you know, as, as as you have people that are, you know, with cameras and laptops and everything else, that might be something that could be in the works sure, down the road. Sure. But uh, you never know. Well, and I just mean from a content perspective too. You've got so much to try to to try to keep on top of. Yeah, you really do. And it, whenever the seasons change, too, it's because we're trying to be as current, excuse me, as current as we can be, it, it makes it a little tricky because once the seasons start to change here and, you know, once, you know, we're getting closer to turkeys and all that kind of stuff and the spring kind of comes, all of a sudden, you know, nobody really wants to see ice fishing, even if there was ice fishing, you know, two, three weeks ago. And so it just as the seasons change, it, it gets a little tricky every every seasonal change. But, uh, you know, it's it's now it's just crazy because uh, you know winter was here and then it left and now it's sort of back and it's, it's still winter in the up but just barely you know we we were hoping to cover the up 200 and that got canceled and then um it's just yeah you know ice is here one day and gone the next and it's been tricky so we but we did you know we're kind of adapting you know we did a we did a sit-down interview with the dnr and talked deer for two weeks and that went over really well i mean every time you talk deer you get a lot of interest and so that went over quite well and we we sat down with some of the wolf people we're going to be doing a whole show dedicated to the wolf population and that'll draw a lot of interest and a lot of controversy and you know so there's different things you can kind of do and so we're learning and adapting as we go i'm glad you brought up the uh, conversation with chad stewart because that's one of the things on my list here yeah you're right man if you want to if you want to start an argument in michigan you talk politics religion or deer management and you had deer management as topic number one so i know that had to get a lot of interest it really did. And, you know, I personally, have, you know, deer hunters have kind of ruined deer hunting for me personally. But it Thank is something you. That... Thank you. I am so glad to hear somebody else say that, too. Thank you, Jimmy Gretzinger. Oh, gosh. It's just, you know, I, I have a hard time. I mean, I, I love to shoot deer. I love to eat deer. I still love deer camp, you know, but it's like, 
you know, you draw up on a deer and you got to figure out, okay, well, who's going to complain about what in the situation? And I, it just has gotten ridiculous, but, uh, but I know it's something we need to cover and, and people love their deer hunting here in Michigan. But um, so I know when we do a, a, a sit down with the DNR and, and then everybody says, oh, you're just in bed with the DNR. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, <laughs> no, we're not. You know, I don't agree with like 90% of what they're doing. I don't even agree with, but you know, we want to have a conversation with them because they're the ones managing our herd. So what does it do for me to, you know, get in an argument with them? Cause then they never want to come and at least want to have the viewers hear like why they're doing what they're doing. You might not agree with it, but I think it's important to hear why they're doing what they're doing. And, and, and even Chad, you know, if he wanted to change all the regulations tomorrow, he can't do that. And so it's like, you know, you try to explain to people, you know, the, the how things work and they don't want to hear that. And it's like, but you know, you got to talk deer because that deer is king here in Michigan. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you mentioned wolf too. I see you guys were up there working on that. Did you find anything out? Did you learn anything while your guys were up there, Jimmy? Well, we're still in the process of putting that together. I was hoping to make that trip with Jordan and I was not able to go. So he interviewed uh, several of the DNR folks that are up there that are literally driving, you know, hundreds of miles per day, tracking wolves. They know right where a lot of the wolves, wolves are across the, the UP and, and, you know, as you know, it really comes down to we can't really do any management until they're delisted. And then it's like, well, you know, how, do, how does that process work? And how, what do we, what can our politicians do to kind of, you know, move that process along? And, you know, so we're just really handicapped. There's just not a lot we can do. So it'll be learning more about that process. And then, uh, you know, a lot of the locals up there think that there's twice as many wolves as what the DNR says. And it, it, who cares, you know, whether there's 600 or 6,000, it doesn't really matter how many are up there. It's, it's impacting deer herd for sure. But until we can do something, it's, you know, everybody's kind of sitting on their hands and they're kind of handicapped on what they can do. So it's like, well, you know, they would love to be able to put a, a hunting season in there, but they can't, but you know, a lot of people just don't understand that. And so, you know, and then there's the social carrying capacity of people just get sick and tired of seeing wolves and they're, you know, and people are just shooting wolves and, you know, that's, that's, that's what's happening up there. And, and you hate to, you know, you, that's happening, but you know, they get a lot of trouble for that, but it's, you know, when they're, they just reach a certain point and they're, they're just going to start doing that, you know? So were you guys able to get any wolves on camera? I don't believe so. They had a lot of fresh tracks, but they have, I mean, what we were able to find out is they have literally thousands of trail cameras up. So they have tons of video and still images of wolves and, um, but I don't believe Jordan got any actual wolves on, on camera, but there are some local groups up there that are, that are uh, taking video from trail cams and or video that people have themselves. And, and uh, so there is some, there are some ways to get some, some footage of wolves that people are can upload. And so we're getting some of that kind of stuff. Uh, okay. Okay. It, it should be a pretty interesting, we're going to devote a whole show to it, if not even more than that, but um, you know, it's it's an interesting topic. It's a hot topic, and and, and similar to deer, it's it's uh, quite controversial on what we should do. But it, there's just not a lot of management that can be done. But there is, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask is since we can't do any management up there, why are we spending all this money looking for them and chasing them and trying to figure out what's going on if we can't do anything about it? You know, so that was one of the questions that we asked, and. Um, so it'll be interesting. You know, I'm really interested to see what people have to say about it. Well, listen, I don't want to take away from your upcoming piece, but what was the answer to that? If, you know, why are we spending this money? Well, they have money earmarked for big game or uh, I don't know if they fall under big game management or if it's uh, there is money earmarked for um, management. I don't know if it's management. I can't remember the term that they have, but they have money earmarked to monitor slash something for for wolves and so they have money in the in the budget to monitor them but they can't do any management of them so um it was it was it's pretty interesting and i and i uh, was not up there so i don't I, i'm going to be watching it along with with uh, <laughs> a lot of our viewers so. gotcha gotcha hang tight jimmy uh, we're talking with jimmy gretzinger the host of michigan out of doors tv the website michigan out of doors tv.com michigan out of doors tv.com Got to take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. But when we come back, I don't know, there are so many things I could ask Jimmy about. We'll just see where the conversation goes. He's an easy guy to talk with. He's a knowledgeable guy. And you know what? Jimmy Gretzinger is one of the good guys, and I appreciate that. More 
Coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine show in Manistee on WMLQ 97.7 FM. You can hear us in Sandusky on WMIC 660 AM 95.3 FM. And you can hear us in the Ute in Manistique on WTIQ 1490 AM 95.3 FM. This segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Versa Skins, Michigan-based, family-owned. There I go again. You know, I love that combination. Versa skins, why buy a bunch of different sets of hunting clothes when you can buy one good quality set that is wind resistant, water resistant, warm and comfortable, and then snap on and zip on an outer shell of a different camo pattern. I mean, it's it's a no brainer. And if you're looking for big sizes, four, five, six X, or if you are a saddle hunter, Versa Skins now makes jackets specifically for saddle hunters. Check them out online at versaskins.com. That's versaskins.com. And they're not just for hunting. I had my Versa Skins on when I was out on Saginaw Bay earlier in the week, and it was cold, and it blocked the wind and kept me comfortable as well. That's versaskins.com. Right now, uh, talking with an icon in the uh, outdoor world here in Michigan. His name is Jimmy Gretzinger. He's the host of Michigan Out of Doors TV, the website, michiganoutofdoorstv.com, michiganoutofdoorstv.com. Jimmy is involved in just about everything when it comes to outdoor communication. The only thing I don't see him doing is a radio show, and I'm darn glad he's not doing one because I wouldn't want to be in competition with him. Although, although, Jimmy, I've thought about this. When it comes time for the old guy to retire, wouldn't it be cool if there was a Michigan Out of Doors radio show? Maybe. I mean, you're, you blazed the trail. You were doing TV and settled into radio pretty nice. That must be the good gig. Yeah, well, you know, maybe, maybe if I ever do decide to retire, maybe we should talk. Maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like bringing it up right gotta, on the air here, huh? <laughs> I got to figure out how to do less TV shows. This whole doing one per week is crazy talk. Well, I'll tell you what. When when I left TV and concentrated on radio, it's like the heavens opened up and the angels sang because it was amazing how much easier it is. Oh boy, yes. I mean, we so we have to do. I don't remember. I know how many years did you do TV? I don't know. Twenty four, five. I don't know. I don't quite know. A, quite a few. Yeah, a bunch. And then were you doing were you doing it every week or were you doing 13 episodes? I was doing it every or? week. I was doing it every week. Yeah, and it was it was it was terrible. It was a grind. It was just it, it it wore me down. It took the fun out of what I was doing. And to be honest with you, Jimmy, the uh, the way I was doing it, not on PBS, but you know, paying paying these stupid outdoor networks to be on them, <laughs> the 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 money just wasn't there anymore. It didn't make any sense financially. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it is a lot of work. It is uh, trying to get a new show every week is, you know, we do 52 and out of those pretty much on all 52, there's something new, but there's probably 40 of them are completely new. And then we try to, you know, every year we're like, well, let's just take August off or whatever it is, you know, but then you, if you sit around for like a week, week and a half, you get all itchy because you're like, <laughs> I got to get on the road. And because the fun part is getting out there and traveling and meeting people and doing stuff and, so, but it does, you know, sometimes it gets a little, it's, it, it's hard to fill content. Sometimes there's plenty of stuff to do, but it's also hard to find stuff. And, you know, that work life balance is always tricky and, yeah, you know, yeah. you could be on the road a lot, but then you got to try to, you know, Jordan has a young family and Jenny's getting close to retirement and I've probably got a little bit left in me yet, but, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing, and the show is very fluid. You know, we usually have an idea of what we're going to do probably on the next week's show, and that's about it. <laughs> you know, we have stuff scheduled out a week to two weeks, sometimes three weeks out, but uh, it's, uh, it's a very fluid thing. We get a lot of viewers that contact us with stuff, and then we're contacting people all the time. And uh, But it's, uh, yeah, you get on that, that deadline, that weekly deadline, it's hard to jump off that, that, uh, <laughs> that wheel. Yeah, and you know, I, I I often look back on my years as television, and I think maybe I'm overly critical sometimes because 
maybe I do remember more of the negative stuff, but you're right. The, the joy of traveling our state, documenting what our opportunities are here and meeting cool people and great people. And I think outdoors men and women are the best people in the face of the earth. That was a very special way to make a living. And I was certainly blessed to be able to do that. For sure. And, and, and it, it gives us a platform that uh, we have to go share stuff that's even more important than the outdoors. That's which I know your faith is important to you. And so that, you know, I know for me, big picture, you know, the show gives me a platform to go talk about things that are uh, really important. And the outdoors is very important as well, but uh, it does give me a platform to go share, you know, what's really important in life. And, and so that's always a big part of it as well. So, you, you know, you mentioned you're only working basically a few weeks ahead. How do you know, Jimmy, because this is what people ask me all the time, how do you know what to put on the show? Well, um, you know, that's, it is a very fluid process. So, like, right now we're trying to figure out the next couple of weeks. So we have, um, right now I was talking with a guy that's got a, gun, a new gun cleaning uh, product, and we're trying to figure out if we want to put that on the show. I'm also talking with a guy about some uh, who's making maple syrup, and we're trying to figure out if he's going to be able to tap trees. So that's a potential story that I might be working on right now. Um, I've got a guy that's running rabbits that I'm kind of working with him a little bit. If, if we can figure out a date that's going to work, there's a guy and his daughter that are catching sturgeon over on Lake St. Clair, and he and I are working trying to figure out a date that we could maybe get over there. Um, so we got that wolf story that we're going to probably put on not next week's show, but the w- show after that. We have our big buck nights that we just take one of those in Novi, and then we got another one coming up in Grand Rapids. So between all those things, that'll kind of round out uh, February and into March. And then, uh, well, February's already gone. I'm sorry, that'll round out March, and then that'll get us into April, and then that'll be, we'll start talking turkeys a little bit. So, um, you know, it just kind of flows. It's, they're just always the next thing, you know, and it just, uh, So, you know, we don't know what we're going to do for turkeys yet, but as we get closer to that season, we'll start calling around some of our turkey guys that we know and be like, okay, which season are you going to get? What are we going to do for that opening day? Are one of us going to hunt? Are we going to go with somebody else? And um, it's, it's, it's very fluid. It's, it's, uh, there's not an exact science to it, but you're constantly dealing with people and trying to figure out, you know, and then travel schedules, um, you know, where you're going to be. Can you, can you piggyback two stories together when you're in, you know, like we have a wild game dinner coming up on Thursday night with, at the Woodshop Social where we tape some of our recipes. And it's like, okay, we're going to spend the night over there. Is there something we could shoot in that area while we're there? Um, so, you know, it's constantly trying to, trying to figure it out and put the pieces together. There's the, the content and production side of what you're doing. And then there's the business side. I mean, it, it, it comes down to you still – got to pay the bills. you gotta, you got to pay your people. And folks can't forget that. I mean, I've seen a lot of people come and go in the outdoor media who thought it was one thing and forgot it was really a business and didn't do the business side of it. And two or three years later, well, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, that's the, that's the part that the, you, you can't ignore that. And that is a constant. Well, later today, I'm going to drive down to Lansing and meet with the folks at MUCC. And they uh, were a part of the show for a long time. And they're wondering, you know, what can we do to start working together a little bit more, whether that's uh, sponsorship stuff, whether that's not, you know, we're going to have that conversation on my way back. I'm meeting a guy that is, uh, has expressed some interest in doing maybe a small sponsorship for the television show to meet him in Grand Rapids. Um, <clears throat> just finalizing a deal with the Michigan Charter Board Association about doing some advertising with them, that they're going to do some advertising with us. So it is a constant, constant thing where we're trying to keep the sponsors we have and always looking for new sponsors and, um, with the advent, you, with not the advent because it's been around for a while, but with social media, oh, a lot of people want to spend their dollars there because it's a little cheaper and it's a little bit more measurable than, than TV numbers. So it, it is a constant struggle and uh, it's, uh, it's tough. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So we're always trying to find like minded sponsors that, you know, want to support the television show and also get their get their product out in front of people or, uh, and, and like what we're doing and want to support the outdoors. Well, Jimmy, you're doing it right. I mean, you've been doing this a long time. I said at the uh, beginning of the conversation here, you've actually been at the helm of the show longer than anybody else has. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. It's really hard to fathom that. You know, when I started, I was 20, 
26 or 27 and now I'm 52 and when I first started I was one of the younger people at all the different shoots and now I'm old and everything hurts a little bit more and <laughs> and uh but uh, fortunately the cameras have gotten smaller and the batteries last longer and you know like my eyes don't work as good so I got the readers and fortunately the autofocus works a lot better than it used to on some of the cameras and uh, but it's still a lot of fun and, uh, you know, meeting people around the state and getting to spend time with them is still a lot of fun. And you get to meet a lot of good people and it's still, it's still, it's really fun for me to try to tell a good story. And, and some weeks you, you, you feel like you really did it and other weeks, uh, it's a little bit more of a struggle, but, um, it's still new content and, you know, you get to meet a lot of people that talk about, you know, when they were kids growing up with their dad or their mom or their uncle or whatever, watching the show, which, which was what I did. Mm -hmm. you know watching michigan outdoors with my dad over the years and it's just part it's fun to be a part of that legacy and you know we're just hoping we can keep it going yeah that is pretty cool to watch to watch those shows when you're a kid and now be the the head guy out there that's uh that's pretty cool pretty cool hey is there anything before i let you go anything that you haven't gone to yet here in michigan or covered yet here that you really would like to to do yet Ooh, that's a good question. I'd love to uh, have someone take me shooting a big elk. That'd be great. <laughs> you and me both, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, that's. Uh, I think we've done. We've done a lot of stuff, and people are always asking me, "Hey, have you ever done?" And I'm like, "Yeah, we probably have, but I'm sure there's something we haven't done, but I haven't figured that out yet." Well, Jimmy, I wish you uh, continued uh, success. As I said, I think yeah, I think you're one of the good guys. You do a great job, and I think what you've done and continue to do for this history and tradition of the outdoors here in Michigan. Um, you got a real good legacy going, and I wish you continued success. Well, right back at you, Mike. You, you have been a staple in the outdoors here in the state of Michigan, and uh, nothing, but, nothing but love for you and what you do and your crew. And uh, always appreciate you having me on, and, and uh, wish you nothing but the best. All right, Jimmy, look forward to talking to you again. Jimmy Gretzinger of Michigan Out of Doors, the website, michiganoutofdoorstv.com, michiganoutofdoorstv.com. Um, I think back to the early days when Mort Neff was doing Michigan Out of Doors. In fact, as I told you, I was going through some old video the other day. I found two things of video of Mort Neff. One of them is Mort and I were on the snow train up in the Agawa or Agawa Canyon up in Ontario. I did a piece with that. And then uh, about a year later, we went down to Lake Erie and we were throwing Erie Deeries tipped with crawlers for walleye on Lake Erie. I keep talking about taking some of these old things and putting them out there on YouTube. I just, um, I got to do it. I got to do it. I think they'd be interesting. Anyway, thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate your time. MichiganOutdoorsTV.com, MichiganOutdoorsTV.com. We'll take a break. When we come back, I don't know. We'll find something to talk about right here on Outdoor Magazine. Welcome back to Outdoor Magazine. Talking to Jimmy about the business side of the business. That's why I'm late getting to the microphone. I was taking care of some of the business side of the business. You can hear the Outdoor Magazine radio show. Uh, let's see who else we've got to talk about. Uh, I think we're down to WSGW in Saginaw, which is fine because I'm in the studios of WSGW right now. I'm here with Charlie Rude. Charlie, the weather is so rotten out there right now. There is not a soul waiting for you, and I don't blame them, you know. As revered and loved as you are, there's no reason for anybody to sit down this weather. <clears throat> but when it turns, they will be here. Say, Charlie, Charlie. And they should. Because Charlie Root is, I mean, he's, he's a very talented man. And Charlie, I appreciate your help on this week's show, as always. Uh, this segment of Outdoor Magazine brought to you by Reader Landscaping. You know, talking about the weather and how it's screwing up our outdoor uh, passions. Think about the guys over at Reader. <laughs> they don't know what's going on right now. Are they still going to be plowing some snow? Are they working on springtime projects? I, I don't know. But one thing you can count on is that whatever uh, Mother Nature throws at us, the folks at Reader will take care of it because it's your nature and our nurture. 
uh, these guys and gals are very, very good at working with Mother Nature and working with the property that you have to get the most out of it. You know, whether it's a springtime project, fall, whatever. But, of course, right now we're thinking about springtime. And I would encourage you, if you have a landscape project that you're looking to get done, don't wait too long. Get in touch with the folks at Reader right now. Uh, talk to their experts in designing your project, their maintenance people, whatever it is. Get on their schedule and get ready to rock for this upcoming springtime because it won't be long and their uh, schedule will, will get filled because they do a great job and a lot of people want to work with them. And I enjoy working with them as well. The website, ReaderLandscaping.com. That's ReaderLandscaping.com. I uh, really enjoyed that conversation with Jimmy Gretzinger. Honestly, he is truly um, one of the good guys. Uh, and he wouldn't have been doing this as long as he has if he, if he, if he wasn't. As I look at the... Um, the list of people who have been in the public eye in the outdoors here in Michigan. It's a very special and revered group of people. Let's go back to, okay, Fred Bear. Fred Bear, of course, the father of modern day archery, uh, made bear archery his home for many years, right there in Grayling here in Michigan. <clears throat> his birthday, by the way, coming up uh, Tuesday, March 5th. Um, I found some old video of Fred that I had. I, I, I have posted my lost Fred Bear interview online. I posted every piece of the audio, everything that he told me in that conversation, I included in uh, that segment on YouTube. It was also on air when I had the TV show. But I found some more B-roll, and that is just backup video that we shot that day at Grouse Haven. And it does include, in, in, in my mind it included this, but I just saw the video to reiterate the folks from Bear Archery shooting prototype crossbows at Grouse Haven with Fred Bear looking over their shoulder. So when you hear these purists say that Fred Bear never would have endorsed this, baloney, what are you basing that on? I saw him. I saw him with my own eyes. I think that he was interested in anything that would further the sport of archery, the business of archery, and bow hunting in general. What, what, what other big names? Mort Neff, who was, again, if you're younger, you don't even know Mort, who Mort is. But, uh, you know, us older folks know. Thursday night time for Michigan Outdoors. And back then it was called Michigan Outdoors uh, with Mort Neff. I was also privileged and, and blessed to get to meet and know and spend some time with Mort Neff. I was looking at my old archives again the other day. I found an old promo of me and Mort Neff sitting on a picnic table. I don't even remember where it was, but it's me and Mort, and he says something like, for 25 years, I spent my time showing the great outdoors to the people of the state of Michigan. Or he says, I'm Mort Neff, yada, yada. And I'm sitting next to him, a young, dark-haired kid with a full head of hair. I said, I'm Mike Avery, and that's also my goal with News 5 Outdoors. And Mort looks at me and says, good luck, Mike. How cool is that? And then I found video of, of him and I on the snow train. We just sat there for hours and had a conversation. I, I've got that documented. Then we went down to Lake Erie, fishing walleye on Lake Erie. You know, to have these experiences throughout my career, throughout my life... To have the memories, which some days are not as clear as I'd like them to be, but then, but then to find these old snippets of video, these old archives. It's just, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Uh, we'll take a break here in the Outdoor Magazine show. When we come back, wrap it all up with a guy who I, uh, another guy who I have much respect for. You know, I guess I think about it. If I, I, if I wouldn't have somebody on the show here if I didn't respect them, right? As I look at the rundown today, every person who's on this, been on the show, I have much respect for. They are experts. They are educators. They are uh, people who want to share a story. They want to share their knowledge. They want to share the information. And that what, that's what makes a good radio guest. Well, wild game chef extraordinaire Dixie Dave Miner is one of them as well. He's an absolute master when it comes to wild game, and he's just an all-around good guy. So we'll take that break. When we come back, we'll wrap it all up. One more reminder, my name is Mike Avery. This show is called Outdoor Magazine. My website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address is Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. 
I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know what you're thinking about. Uh, More coming up after the break right here on Outdoor Magazine. Page 39. That's what I'm being told. Page 39. I'm going to write this down. Page 39. What I'm talking about is page 39 in the uh, Wild Game Chef Extraordinaire Dixie Dave Minor Cookbook. A few weeks ago, we started, <laughs> again, I don't know why I didn't do this earlier. You know, Dave joins me at the end of each week's show, and he's always got a wonderful recipe, and the vast majority of those have been covered in Dave's Wild Game Cookbook, which this week is page 39. David, what is page 39? Walleye Key Largo. Walleye Key Largo. Excellent. Man, that was a hit at the restaurant. When we had the restaurant, that was one of the big sellers, too. Walleye Key Largo. Okay, so I will post that recipe on my Facebook page this week. And, David, you know what else I noticed? You know, we're, we're talking about this cookbook, and you say you can't get it anymore? One of the silent auction items in our Trinity Monitor Wild Game Dinner and Auction was a Dixie Dave Miner cookbook. Oh, wow. How'd you get that? I don't even know. I got to check on that. I was wondering that myself. You know, there's aftermarket uh, books out there, uh, you know, like at uh, some of these aftermarket places that you could uh, pick them up. But they were going for big money, sometimes 40, 50 bucks. What did you charge when you were selling that? Not 20. <laughs> you should have charged more. <laughs> all right, before I eat up all your time, let's get this, let's get this walleye recipe because walleye are kind of oh, hot across the state right now, as you know. Oh, yeah. Everybody I'm talking to has been getting them. So, uh, it's, like I said, it's the walleye key largo, and you need about six to eight ounces of boneless, skinless filet per person, one or two beaten up eggs, flour to dredge the fish in, and you can get Key Largo schnapps, you can actually buy it in airline bottles, too, at some of the grocery stores, the uh, or party stores, they sell it, or you can buy a half a pint, too, of it. You need a jar of chicken gravy, a couple ounces of sliced almonds, a couple ounces of uh, shredded coconut, un- untoasted yet, because you're going to toast this at the end, and you're going to need one to one and a half cups of fruit, either canned, fresh, frozen. It could be peaches and pineapple and pears and whatever you feel like you like to eat. By all means, use it. You could use raspberries, strawberries, blueberries. You need a half onion diced up fine, uh, four ounces of heavy cream, a tablespoon of butter or uh, margarine, and olive oil to saute with. So you're going to dredge the fish in flour, then in the beaten up eggs, and put a small amount of uh, oil into a large heated frying pan. Place the fish with the skin side up, so when you turn it, you only want to turn it once. The uh, rib side will be facing the diner. Brown it on one side, turn it over, and then saute for just a minute or two. And that's going to almost fully cook this, because most of the fillets, once you take them off the heat, they're going to continue to cook a little bit. Place them in a casserole, wipe the pan out with a paper towel, and then saute the onion in a little bit of that butter for one or two minutes until tender. Add the key largo schnapps and then simmer it for another minute or so. You just want to burn that alcohol off. Add the gravy, bring it to a boil, the heavy cream. Add the fruit, bring that to a boil. And after you put the fish in a casserole, you're going to spoon this over the top of it and you're going to cook it only for about three or four more minutes because fish is almost done already. Remove the fish to individual plates and then spoon the mixture over the top. And because the hot sauce is still you know, hot and it's going to stay nice and warm for a while. Sprinkle with coconut and almonds and mm. put it under a burner and be very careful because it's going to brown off real, co- real quick and might even burn on you. So you got to really watch what you're doing. Brown it until it's nicely well toasted. You could serve this 
with uh, rice or your favorite pasta, and it goes just great with either. Oh, I remember this. I can visualize this in my mind, and it was so good. And again, I want to go back to when you're cooking fish, um, remember that it will continue to cook, right? Right. When you take it out of the pan, it's going to continue to cook for another little minute because the top and bottom is hot, and it's going to you know, migrate down to the middle of it, and it's going to fi- finish cooking it pretty quick. Salmon's another one that cooks fast like that. So, I mean, you don't want to undercook fish. You don't want to overcook. But, I mean, what what if you overcook, it gets tough. If you undercook, it's mushy. I mean, what? how do we look at that? Well, walleye is one of them fish that if you overcook it a little bit, it's going to be okay. It's not going to ruin the dish or anything like that. It's just going to kind of dry it up a little bit. The more you cook it, the more dry it's going to become. All right, David, this is one of my favorites. Walleye Key Largo on page 39 of the cookbook. I will post that on my Facebook page. And uh, listen, next week when we get together, we can talk about our Trinity Monitor event and how it went. Oh, okay. That sounds great. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. That'll be a great event. Look forward to seeing you there. Wild Game Chef Extraordinaire, Dixie Dave Miner, a big part of the Outdoor Magazine show. And again, thank you, Dave, for joining us this week. It, uh, it's been an interesting show, right? It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Every one of these shows is fun. Some more fun than others. And this one has actually been a riot for me. I hope you have enjoyed it as well. My website, MikeAveryOutdoors.com. MikeAveryOutdoors.com. My email address is Mike at MikeAveryOutdoors.com. And I'm serious. I'd love to hear from you. Want to get your input? Let me know what's on your mind, what you think. If you want to share your outdoor adventures, your outdoor experiences, your video, your pictures, please. Send it to me, Mike, at MikeAveryOutdoors.com, and I will do my best to share it on my uh, Facebook page. Uh, let's see what Mother Nature does for us this week. Hopefully she'll give us a break. You can get out and enjoy it, and then we'll talk next time right here on Outdoor Magazine. Outdoor Magazine.